This is Bone Chillers to disturb your dreams. Dare to join us? Click subscribe. Ring the bell. But remember, we cannot guarantee your safety from the nightmares that await. Prepare to be thrilled, chilled, and filled with a sense of dread you'll find nowhere else. Welcome to the darkness. We've been waiting. It's past your bedtime. My name is Jane. I am the babysitter. The family I work for is affluent, living in seclusion on an opulent, sprawling estate flanked by impenetrable woods. Their young son, Edgar, is my sole responsibility. I first noticed it one evening. Edgar, typically vivacious, seemed unresponsive. His eyes were vacant, pallid ghostly, and his voice reduced to a disturbing whisper. He would wander aimlessly, drawn to dark corners, shying away from human interaction. Soon, he started losing weight, his fair skin turned ashen, his once bright blue eyes sunk into hollow, black pits. The transformation was gradual, more horrific each passing day. Desperate, I approached his parents, but they dismissed my concerns, claiming Edgar's condition was a family matter. Peculiar, but I didn't pry further. One night, as I checked on Edgar, I found him sitting up in bed, staring blankly at the wall. As I approached, he snapped his head towards me, eyes darker, almost primal. His voice, now a guttural rasp, whispered, they're coming. It sent chills down my spine. Next day, I found the parents in a similar state. The same vacant eyes, deathly pallor, and sudden aversion to light. It was chilling, whatever afflicted Edgar had taken them to. Fear crept into my heart. Was this some contagious disease? Or a genetic anomaly exclusive to the family? I was an outsider, yet I lived under the same roof, breathed the same air. Would I be next? That's when I decided to dig deeper. I started researching their family history, discreetly snooping around their antiquated library. Among dusty books and fading pictures, I found a cryptic journal dated back several centuries. The journal belonged to an ancestor, a scientist, an occultist, who'd experimented with life and death. He had created a curse as a form of punishment for those who crossed him, transforming them into zombie-like creatures. Over generations, the curse had manifested as a silent epidemic, periodically afflicting the family. I felt a chill run down my spine as I read this. Had I uncovered a centuries-old supernatural secret? I was no longer afraid only determined. I had to break the cycle before I became a victim. According to the journal, there was a cure, a ritual to reverse the curse. It required a night of the full moon, an amulet hidden somewhere in the house, and the courage to face the cursed. The next full moon was just days away. The following days, Edgar and his parents deteriorated rapidly. Their physical form decayed, behavior turned volatile, and communication became non-existent. The nights were worse, filled with unearthly sounds of growls and snarls. I used this time to find the amulet, a small, dark stone etched with ancient symbols. The full moon night was upon us. Armed with the amulet and the knowledge of the ritual, I prepared myself. In the dead of night, under the glowing full moon, I began. The ritual involved reciting an incantation while placing the amulet on each of the afflicted. I started with Edgar, who lay listless in his room. As I placed the amulet on him, a chilling wind howled through the house. I recited the incantation, and his eyes flickered, a faint glow of life returning. Next were his parents, equally daunting. The process was exhausting, and the house seemed to fight back with sudden gusts of wind, slamming doors, and flickering lights. But I persevered. As I completed the ritual, a silence fell over the house. I was weary but hopeful. I collapsed on a nearby chair, waiting for the dawn. Morning came, with it, signs of a miracle. Edgar's parents were lucid, their eyes clear and voice normal. Edgar was up too, his skin regaining color, his voice a sweet echo of the lively boy he once was. The curse was broken, the silent epidemic ended. As an outsider, I'd done what generations of the family couldn't. The supernatural curse was thwarted, at least for now. The job of a babysitter had brought me face to face with an unimaginable horror. As I looked at Edgar, 
now playing joyfully, I knew it was worth it. But deep down, I knew, the curse was merely dormant, the silent epidemic paused, ready to strike again in the heart of this secluded, affluent family. The Crimson Carousel Alice, a wayward waif of thirteen, fled her tormenting life to the harsh embrace of the world. On a tempestuous, rain-soaked night, a beacon of transient refuge emerged from the gloom and abandoned carnival, weather-beaten and mournful, echoing with forgotten laughter. Alice ventured into the spectral arena, the ghostly echoes of joviality replaced by an eerie silence, disturbed only by the whining wind. Lost amidst the forlorn relics, she found herself drawn to an antiquated carousel at the center. Painted a once vibrant crimson, the carousel's hue had decayed to a haunting, blood-stained shade. Its spectral horses gazed out, frozen in a perpetual gallop. Curiosity pulling her towards the crimson carousel, Alice stepped onto its chilling platform and chose a wide-eyed steed. As the carousel began to creak and rotate, a guttural lullaby seeping from an unseen organ filled the air, each note drenched in dread. The carnival around her blurred, and a bone-rattling shiver coursed through her as the world shifted. Suddenly, she found herself in the midst of a bustling crowd. The once dilapidated carnival was alive, vibrant under the summer sun. But there was an underlying sense of dread in the eyes of the other carousel riders, children like her, their smiles were strained, eyes wide with terror. As the ride ended, she watched them be led away, their pleas muffled by the cheerful carnival music. Alice found herself back in the present, the blood having drained from her face. She stumbled off the carousel, her heart pounding. Was it a vision or a ghostly replay of a forgotten time? But the chilling allure of the carousel persisted. Despite the fear gnawing at her, Alice climbed aboard again, choosing a different, fiery-eyed horse. This time, the carousel whirled her back to a winter carnival. The faces were different but the fear was the same. Alice watched in horror as the children were led away by a hulking figure, their muffled cries swallowed by the winter wind. Once again, she returned to her desolate present, cold sweat trickling down her spine. She knew then that she was seeing the grim history of the Crimson Carousel, the lost souls who, like her, sought refuge and found their doom. The carousel was not just an echo of the past, it was a macabre chronicle of its victims. Compelled by a morbid determination, Alice decided to ride one last time. She had to uncover the identity of the looming figure, the tormentor of those ill-fated children. She mounted the grandest horse, an ebony beast with fiery rubies for eyes. As the lullaby swelled to a nightmarish crescendo, the carousel spun back into the past. This time, the carnival was shrouded in a misty autumn evening. She saw the children, their eyes pleading for salvation, being led away by the figure. But as he passed a mirror, his reflection caught Alice's eye. It was the carnival's owner, a man known as Barnabas, his face a twisted mask of sadistic glee. Alice was hulled back into the silent, present-day carnival. The haunting truth of the crimson carousel dawned upon her, it was an instrument of innocent death, and she was poised to be its next victim. It was a chilling paradox, her refuge was her impending doom. But Alice was not ready to give up. The once lively carnival had transformed into a phantom playground. Armed with the knowledge she'd gleaned, she roamed through the abandoned grounds, stumbling upon a dilapidated shack behind the Hall of Mirrors. Inside, she found newspaper clippings documenting the unsolved disappearances of runaways at the carnival. Alice took these back to the Crimson Carousel. She placed the clippings onto the platform and mounted the ebony horse. As it spun, she whispered the names of the missing children, her voice rising above the grim lullaby. The carousel jerked violently and the spectral crowds appeared again. But now, they stood still, their eyes on Alice. Barnabas materialized, his vile grin etched on his face. With each name Alice called, a spectral child broke free from his grip. Their once fearful eyes now glowed with courage. Barnabas recoiled as one by one, they turned on him, their spectral forms overwhelming him. A cacophonous cry erupted, and Alice was thrust back into the present. The crimson carousel stood motionless, its haunting allure gone. Instead of fear, a sense of peace settled over the abandoned carnival. The storm had passed, leaving a clear night sky. 
the spectral children had found their peace, and Alice knew she had broken the sinister cycle. From that night forward, the carnival was just an abandoned relic of the past, its horrifying secret buried with the spectral children's newfound peace. Alice had survived the Crimson Carousel, a young runaway who found her courage in the face of unimaginable horror. Eyes in the Mist In a world fractured by catastrophe, sight was Lucy's salvation. But as much as it was a gift, it was equally a curse, a relentless mirror reflecting a twisted, terrifying reality. Each day, Lucy's keen eyes would scan the misty woods encircling her cabin. It wasn't the visible world that concerned her. It was the hidden horrors, the terrifying mutations lurking behind the veil of visibility that gave her nightmares. Lucy had a unique ability. She could see the mutations long before they revealed themselves to the naked eye, the monstrous humanoids transformed by the world's end. She was haunted by their grotesque forms, the twisted limbs, gaping mouths, and eyes, always the eyes shimmering like dying stars. The mutations were coming closer, inching towards her hideout. With each passing day, the numbers grew, their spectral bodies flickering at the edge of her sight, an impending doom. Watching them get closer was akin to a ticking time bomb, Lucy's heart synchronizing with its rhythm, accelerating with each tick. Lucy knew that time was a scarce luxury she could no longer afford. She was trapped in a grim race against the clock, each tick a beat closer to the end. She had to prepare herself, to devise a defense, or perhaps an escape. Every heartbeat screamed urgency, the echoes resonating through the silent cabin. She started with traps, rudimentary ones, but potent. Pitfalls lined with sharpened branches, tripwires hooked to crude explosives anything that might slow the mutants down. Yet, she knew these wouldn't be enough. The mutated humanoids were relentless, their twisted bodies endowed with the grotesque strength of survival. The mutants were now a stone's throw from her cabin. Their presence was like an ominous fog, each night growing thicker, the days bleaker. Lucy's heart pounded in her chest as her eyes flitted over the forest, the glimmering eyes in the mist a harsh reminder of her dwindling time. Desperate, she started working on an escape plan. She started to assemble a makeshift raft. If she could navigate the treacherous currents of the river nearby, she might stand a chance. It was a bleak hope, but hope nonetheless. In the dead of the night, she toiled, her hands blistering and bloody under the strain. Yet, she worked relentlessly, her determination an unwavering beacon against the encroaching darkness. As the raft neared completion, the mutants arrived at the edge of her cabin. The mist made their bodies semi-visible, ghastly apparitions in the night. Their eyes glowed with a feverish intensity, casting horrifying shadows that danced on the cabin walls. Now, they were just outside her door. A cold gust of wind whistled through the trees as Lucy lugged her raft towards the river. Her heart raced, threatening to break free from her chest. The ground under her feet felt like it was slipping away, each step a struggle against time and fear. Suddenly, there was a crash. The cabin door splintered into shards under the assault of the mutated humanoids. They lunged out of the mist, their grotesque forms a horrifying spectacle against the pale moonlight. Lucy stumbled, her breath hitching in her throat. She turned towards the river, the raging waters her only chance of survival. With a final burst of energy, she heaved the raft into the river, leaping on just as the current swept it away. She didn't dare look back, her eyes locked onto the horizon. The furious roars of the mutants faded into the background, swallowed by the relentless river. In the end, her sight had been both a blessing and a curse. The terror she had seen had driven her, given her the will to survive. As the first light of dawn pierced the mist, Lucy breathed a sigh of relief. For the first time in a long while, her eyes saw not the ghastly glow of monstrous eyes, but the comforting, warm light of a new day. For her, a sign of survival, a sign of hope. Lucy had won her race against time. Rituals of the Pale In the hushed town of Ashbrook, the Ash Maidens held dominion. Five witches, enchanting and ethereal, who manipulated the townsfolk with an uncanny combination of alluring beauty and potent magic. Jack, a dedicated anthropologist, 
arrived with the curiosity of a cat and the stubbornness of an ox. He was interested in their unique ash makeup rituals, said to possess mind control properties. His obsession was not only academic, he yearned to find a way to disrupt the power balance that seemed so terribly wrong. Upon arriving, he was struck by the eeriness of the town. Ashbrook was quiet, its people obedient and almost lifeless. The Ash Maidens ruled over the town like ethereal goddesses, dressed in robes of black and silver, their faces painted with an intriguing grey ash. Under the guise of a weary traveller, Jack got closer to the Maidens. They accepted him, entranced by his curiosity, offering him insights into their practices, including the Ash Ritual. They told him the Ash was a blend of sacred herbs and remains of the Old Ones. Who the Old Ones were, they never disclosed only whispering about those who had come before. He was allowed to watch the process, a macabre choreography of smearing ashes, chants, and shared consciousness. However, he was never allowed to witness the creation of the ash. The nights turned into days, and the days into weeks. Jack's mind became foggy, his purpose blurred. He found himself increasingly drawn to the maidens, their beauty intoxicating, their voices soothing whispers in his dreams. Still, a flicker of resistance burned within him. One day, following the faint echo of his purpose, he managed to steal a sample of the ash. He sent it to an old friend, a pathologist. While waiting for the results, his life spiraled out of control. He saw the maidens everywhere, even when they weren't there. He could hear their enchanting voices, commanding him to serve, to forget, to let go. His nights were filled with terrifying dreams, visions of the old ones, the day he received the analysis, his heart froze. The ashes weren't just sacred herbs but human remains. A horrifying realization struck him, the ash maidens were using the ashes of the townsfolk, the old ones, to control the living. Armed with this knowledge, Jack set about to free Ashbrook. He stole more ash, now the symbol of death and control, and poured it into the town's well, hoping the ash's potency would dilute and break its enchantment. The maidens felt the disturbance. Anger and fear radiated from them, casting a palpable chill over Ashbrook. They searched for the disruptor but failed to suspect Jack, their minds clouded by their belief in his obedience. In the coming days, the town seemed to wake from a dream. People questioned, murmured, and finally rebelled. Their anger boiled over, their fear forgotten. The maidens, beautiful but frail without their ash, stood helpless as their rule crumbled, however, the end was far from painless. The ash maidens, cornered and desperate, invoked the old ones, triggering a nightmarish display of dark magic. Shadowy figures wreaked havoc in Ashbrook, but the townsfolk, bolstered by newfound freedom, fought back. Jack watched as the town he had come to free battled for its liberation. His work wasn't over, he knew he had to face the maidens. He confronted them, their beauty now marred by fear and wrath. One by one, he fought them off, using sheer determination and iron will. When the dawn came, the maidens were no more, their enchanting beauty and deadly ashes part of Ashbrook's dark past. Jack, bruised and tired, found solace in his victory, but the memory of the ash maidens, their power and cruelty, haunted him forever. In the quiet town of Ashbrook, the old ones were laid to rest, and the townsfolk, finally free, began the process of healing. And Jack, his purpose fulfilled, left the town, carrying with him the tale of the Ash Maidens, a grim reminder of the perils of unchecked power. The Forest's Symphony of Fear Tim was a world-renowned violinist, a maestro of melody, who now found solace in the solitude of the woods. Grief had engulfed him ever since his wife and daughter perished in a tragic accident. He left behind his fame, his adoring audience, and his metropolitan life, seeking solace in the silent whispers of the forest. It was there he met Ithaza, an elder demon lurking in the shadows, feeding on the desolation of the lost. Ithaza emerged from the darkness, his voice resounding like a bone-chilling breeze. Your despair echoes through these woods, violinist. I propose a trade that might relieve your sorrow. Tim, desperate and haunted by his grief, dared to listen. The demon's deal was simple, the soul of each camper they harvest together would manifest into a unique melody, 
a symphony of despair and desolation, which Tim could play on his violin. In return, Ithaza would feed on the potent emotions released. As twisted as it was, Tim agreed, hoping these symphonies could fill the void left by his family. He became the siren of the woods, luring campers into the depths where Ithaza would claim their souls. With every life taken, a new haunting melody was born, a chilling note that stirred a strange sense of peace within him. Yet, as the body count rose, the music's allure began to wane. The melody started to echo not only his sorrow but also his guilt. Each haunting tune was a constant reminder of his choices. Yet, he could not resist the soothing solace they provided, a wicked balm for his bleeding heart. One evening, a melody was born unlike any other. It was the soul of a young girl, her innocence and joy resonating with the rhythm of a lullaby he knew too well. It was his deceased daughter's favorite song. Holding his violin, he played the melody, each note piercing his heart like a poisoned arrow. He saw his little girl in every stroke, her twinkling eyes, her infectious laughter, her innocent soul. It was as if his daughter was with him, yet the crushing realization that it was another's child shattered him. Tim questioned the unholy pact, his heart pounding with regret. He was drowning in a sea of guilt, each wave crashing against him with relentless force. The image of the young girl and the innocent lullaby triggered an overwhelming surge of emotion. Enough was enough. With newfound resolve, Tim decided to end this nightmare. His plan was simple yet dangerous. He would lure Thaza using his own despair, the potent emotion that had once attracted the demon. In the heart of the forest, Tim played a melody on his violin. It was a symphony of remorse, a poignant requiem for the lives lost. It echoed through the woods, reaching out to the demon. As Ithaza approached, Tim dropped his violin and faced the demon. His eyes mirrored his resolution, the potent despair replaced with steely determination. This ends now, Ithaza, he declared. A battle ensued, not of fists but of wills. Tim, armed with his resolve and guilt, held his ground against the demon. He fought with every ounce of strength, his remorse acting as a shield against the demon's darkness. It was a symphony of fear, every note vibrating with the intensity of their clash. Finally, in the most desperate note of their symphony, Tim emerged victorious. He had trapped Ithaza, turning the demon's desire for despair against him. With the demon's defeat, a somber melody echoed through the woods, a tribute to the lost souls. In the wake of his victory, Tim left the woods, carrying with him the guilt and the haunting melodies of the souls he helped harvest. His heart ached with remorse, each heartbeat a painful reminder of his transgressions. Yet, there was a silver lining. Tim, now a changed man, dedicated his life to the memory of the lives lost. He played their melodies to the world, each symphony a plea for forgiveness and a vow that their sacrifice wouldn't be in vain. The forest symphony of Firthos became a chilling ballad of a widowed violinist's guilt and redemption, his transgressions echoing in every haunting note and his atonement whispered in every sorrowful melody. Thank you for watching, and remember the darkness awaits. Until our paths cross again, stay fearful and stay subscribed.